All right. Do you think I was talking a little fast during the announcement, so? <laughs> Sermon tonight probably been about 10 minutes long. <laughs> then everybody be saying, hey, give that guy coffee and know what that's again. <laughs> we'll get home before midnight. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's take our Bibles and turn there. Nehemiah chapter 1. We are checking out tonight of Ezekiel after, I don't know, almost two years uh, in that book. Uh, you know, I told myself when I started Ezekiel that I was not going to be one of those preachers, and there's like five of us in the history of the church that's actually preached through that book. Uh, I was not going to be one that just left out humongous chunks of Ezekiel. I was going to preach it all the way through. And the uh, truth of the matter is, I've ended up leaving about five chapters out myself. Uh, I just didn't want to spend the next six months talking about that temple with you. I thought we should move on, and we're moving on now to Nehemiah, and we're going to see in this incredibly instructive book a great deal for how we go about building our lives in Christ. So we're taking Nehemiah chapter 1 tonight, the whole chapter, uh, which is practically just a, a chapter of Nehemiah's prayer to God. And we're going to be looking at that and all that it uh, reveals to us, both about our God and about how we should pray. So let's take a look here at Nehemiah chapter 1, and we'll pick up here with verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, during the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had returned from exile. They said to me, the survivors of the province who returned from the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down, and its gates have been burned down. And when I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, Lord God of heaven, the great and awe-inspiring God, who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept the commands and statutes and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the ends of the earth, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I choose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and have compassion on him in the presence of this man. And at that time, I was the king's cupbearer. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we bow before you as a people that are grateful and amazed that you, Lord, allow us to pray to you and that you hear our prayers. And God, I pray tonight as we study this prayer of Nehemiah that you would teach us much about yourself and much about the way that you want us to pray. And help us to see, God, that our lives are built first when we pray. And Lord, I just ask you to guide us in such a way now that every heart would come close to you, that we would leave tonight different than the way we came in. Help us, Lord, to take this word and be more equipped to do the works of ministry, the works of service that please and honor and glorify you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. We come tonight to a new journey in the word of God, a journey through the book of Nehemiah. The theme of Nehemiah is rebuilding. There is a rebuilding physically, and there is a rebuilding spiritually in this book. As Ray Stedman puts it, this book contains reconstruction and reinstruction. The people of God had been in the land of Babylon now for over a hundred years. In fact, hands have changed. The uh, uh, 
Uh, new management has taken over, I guess you could say, in Babylon. It is transferred now to the Medo-Persian kingdom. And for a hundred years, the people of God have been in that nation. And there has been three waves of exiles to return to Jerusalem during that time. And the time of Nehemiah comes after and at the end of that third wave of exiles coming back to the land. We see painfully that the land is absolutely in shambles. It still is left the way that King Nebuchadnezzar left it when he tore down the walls and burned down the temple and left the entire city rubble before the world and its eyes. It's a testimony to all nations of Israel's shame. And this reality hits the heart of Nehemiah hard while he is in the fortress city of Susa. And if you might be wondering why he's in Susa, well, here's how the kings of the Medo-Persian Empire rolled. They would go to different kingly palaces during different times of the year, kind of like people living in Ohio during the summer and going to Florida in the winter or something like that. And this is the season in which the king is in the fortress city of Susa and his cupbearer Nehemiah is there with him. And while he is there, Hanani, his brother, shows up and Nehemiah asks him, the Bible says, about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had returned from exile. And here's their response. The survivors in the province who returned from exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned down. They're in a bad shape. Now think about that for a moment to get your mind around what has just been said. A wall, my friends, is more than a physical structure, isn't it? While right now in our own country, you have a lot of concern. You have a lot of jabber. You have a lot of talking heads talking about a wall because a wall is not just a wall. A wall makes a statement. When a wall is put up, it tells nations that we are here, we are alive, we are strong, and with the abilities by which we built this wall, we will defend this nation, or in this case, this city. Now, when a wall is torn down, that makes a statement too. That lets everybody know we are weak, we are defenseless, we have no means to protect ourselves, and with the ability by which this wall was taken down so you can come in and take us down as well. It makes a statement to everybody. Now, Nehemiah hears this word. The wall is torn down, and his heart sinks right down to his stomach. He says, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days. Now, friends, we see men mourn in the Bible all the time when tough times come upon them. Jacob was told Joseph had been killed, and he mourned. David mourned when his first, when his son was lost to death. Our Lord Jesus, the Bible tells us, mourned and wept. All these men and our Lord himself did one thing in these situations. They ran to the Father and they prayed to the Father. They knew that in God and in God alone could these darkest clouds that was over their lives be removed. And so they went to him in prayer. And that's what Nehemiah did. And tonight we are going to see very thankfully that God hears the prayers of the devastated, the destitute, and the downhearted. And we'll learn through it all that there will be no building of Jerusalem's wall, nor the spiritual walls of our hearts and souls if there is no earnest seeking of God in prayer. So let's look and let's learn now from God's word as we see first tonight that we pray to build. We pray to build. When a carpenter takes to his task of building, what he does is he goes out and he gathers up his wood and his nails and his hammer. When the construction man decides to build something, he gets all of his machinery together and he gets his crew together. But for the Christian, our first order comes in this way. When we want to build, we pray. When we want to build our hearts in the Lord, we pray. When you want to build a building to worship in, you pray. 
When you want your life to be built upon the solid rock, not sinking sand, you pray. A constant practice of our Lord himself was to pray to his Father, even in his most intense moments of trial, when he was facing the wrath of God for you and me. He got with the Father and he prayed, if it is possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He was building a church, you see. He was building a people that would be bought by his very blood, and so he prayed. And this is what Nehemiah does as well. He prays. He wants the walls built. He wants Israel's disgrace to be removed. He wants God to be honored, and so he prays. First thing, he prays. Now, I just want to take a moment here to just offer this. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Isn't it weird how Christians sometimes deal with prayer? Like it's a burden to us. Like it's a problem. Like it's something that interferes with our lives because we are so important and our schedules are so critical to the turning of this globe around the sun. It bothers us. I want you to see here, friend, there is, there is nothing more important you can do Nothing more important I can do, nothing more important we can do than to be a people of prayer to our God. And I want you to see here with me why that's the case. And it's the case because we pray depending on God. If you show me someone who is not a man or not a woman of prayer, I will show you somebody that is not depending on God. That's just the blunt truth of the matter. And in truth, all prayer really is depending on God. When we pray, we are showing our utter need. We are showing our total dependence upon God when we pray. We aren't looking to him and saying, Lord, I've pretty well got this figured out. I've pretty well got this under control. I just need a little bit of help from you to kind of get over the edge with this. No, when we pray, we come to him and we say, God, we are absolutely empty of everything. We have nothing to bring to this table, and we are calling upon you for all. That's prayer. That's prayer. We're saying to him, without you, we can do nothing. But through you, we know we can do all things. When Nehemiah prays to God, he brings nothing to the table but his heart. And it must be the same with us. God delights in our prayers because he delights in our dependence on him. Now, we also must pray persistently. One thing you'll notice about the life of Nehemiah, and it starts right here in chapter 1, and it's going to go all through the book, is that Nehemiah is a man that lived in prayer in a persistent way. He was not afraid to rattle the doors of God's throne with his prayers. Sometimes men believe their prayers are of such substance and strength that it actually bothers and burdens God for him to hear from them more than once. But that is nonsense. By the way, don't, please, if you ever believe it, please just don't say it to me. Because it, it just, it just, it's a pastoral pet peeve of mine. When, when somebody says, well, you know, I prayed about this once and I don't want to bother God with it again. Yeah, you, you are so incredible. I'm sure it really would. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure he's sitting in heaven being like, well, you know, I'm ruling here, but then there's Sheila, you know, not you, not the other Sheila. <laughs> Problem is, you know, we've got like six different names in this church, and somebody's going to get hit with one of them. <laughs> Don't ever believe that. Don't ever believe it's a burden to God for you to pray persistently. Even to pray the same thing. And you may be saying, well, you know, Jesus taught us, don't pray in vain repetition. Yeah, I completely, I completely believe that is true. Don't pray vain repetition. What is vain repetition? Here's a vain repetition. God, heal me of this. God, save me of this. And you walk away saying, he ain't going to heal me. He ain't going to save me. And the next day you pray the same thing. That is a vain repetition. The Bible says such a man as that ought not to expect anything from the Lord. Double-minded and unstable in all his ways. But pray persistently. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 15. Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, 
lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut. My children are in bed and I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of this persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and he who knocks, it will be open. And all of those words in the Greek are in the continual state. Okay, a, a, a more literal translation would be keep knocking, keep seeking, keep asking. Is what Jesus is saying. Jennifer and I had a small apartment in Louisville when we married and we were the first sort of of our friends that got married and the married life and the single life of our friends didn't always mesh together like it should and uh, as we're snuggling in our little apartment one night uh newlyweds I don't know we've been married just a little bit and uh, we're living the life, man. You know, we, we've got a, a 400 square foot apartment in Louisville, Kentucky. We are together and the world is before us. We are ready. And one of our friends comes that night and he knocks on the door. It's about midnight. And I tell Jennifer, I said, I know who that is. I'm not getting up to answer the door. So the knocking quits. In about 10 seconds, it comes back louder. It keeps beating a little more louder. And I'm like, nope, I'm not getting up. It is not going to happen. Whatever he wants, that's his problem. I'm not getting up to answer the door. So he beats for a while, and then he finally stops. And I'm thinking, yep, yeah, we finally ran him off. No. His car is parked in front of the window to our bedroom. So the next thing I see is headlights come through the window and a horn start honking. I'm like, I'm definitely not getting up now. It's not going to happen. And he keeps on the horn and he keeps up with this. And he keeps just going and going and going with this. I'm like, I'm not going to be moved. <laughs> Finally, he gets out of the car. And I'm thinking, all right, we have won the day. Then I hear this beating on the window to our bedroom. Thump, 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 thump. I, okay, fine, fine. I got it. Now, here's the thing. Me and this guy are the best of friends. And uh, I love him dearly. I didn't love him enough to get out of my bed that night. As Jesus said, I'm not getting up because he's my friend. I'm getting up because of this persistent beating around everything and waking up this entire apartment complex because he wants something. So, I go to the door and I say, man, what do you want? Uh, man, I was wondering if I could sleep here tonight. Yes, come in, lay down, and sleep. I'm going back to sleep too. Of course, I got to bed and couldn't sleep the rest of the night. But I thought about these words of Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. When you're going to pray to him, approach him in that way. And don't give up until you hear from him. That's the type of prayer that he likes. That's the type of prayer that shows our faith in him. We don't give up. We need to pray the same way, expecting the same results that Nehemiah expected. This is the mindset by which we need to build our lives and our ministry and prayer. And this brings us to look secondly tonight at we pray to bless. We pray to build. Now we're saying we pray to bless. When it comes to prayer, all of us have so very much to ask for, so very much to pray for, so many issues, so many pains, so many trials happening that we feel we need to dump them all at Jesus' feet, and we certainly do. And he is glad for us to do so. But before we do that, and even above and beyond what we have to ask God and be, th and be thanking God for, when we pray, we need to know that we are to pray first to honor God. We honor God in our prayer. I want you to see how Nehemiah begins this prayer in verse 5. This is how he starts it out. He says, Lord God of heaven, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. Very first thing 
Lord of heaven, Lord God of heaven, the great and all expiring God, who keeps his gracious covenant for those who love him and keep his commands. That's the very first thing Nehemiah has to say to him. Our Lord Jesus taught us to pray the same way. He said, when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And of course, if you're like most Americans, you did not grow up with hallowed being a word. So what in the world was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying, when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. You acknowledge him in his holiness. You acknowledge who he is. When you pray, you, you honor him in that way. We are to glorify God and confess to him that above our situation and our needs, we count him as worthy of our lives. And you want to know the amazing thing? When you pray to God that way, I mean, you've got burdens on your heart, something's wrong with your wife, something's wrong with your kids, something's wrong at work, something's wrong in the world, something's wrong in the church, and you can't make the bills, and you can't do this, and you can't seem to make this happen, and you come to God, and you've got all of this that you're, you're ready to ask him for, and you just start off by saying, Lord God, you who have created all things, you who are awesome and holy and wonderful, who the angels praise and the church rejoices in in heaven, Lord God, I come before you. It's amazing what just confessing that does for your heart. It lifts it instantly because you understand that you are coming to a God who can very much handle your little problems. But your problems are big to you. But when you confess and honor him for who he is, you see that they are small before him. There was a, a man one time named Carol Dixon that was one of three men that was stranded on a raft in the ocean. And that has to be one of the most helpless feelings you could ever imagine. You're just on this raft held up by the air in these tubes, surrounded by sharks and whales bigger than this church with a vast emptiness of nothing as far as your eyes can see. Him and these three men are in there. They have no food. They have no water. But you know what they did have? They had prayer. And Dixon says that, quote, there was a comfort in passing our burden to someone bigger than we in this empty vastness. And he goes on to say that when they prayed, they had a fourth person in the raft with them. And that person was God. Nehemiah knew something of that. And that is why he also acknowledges that God is the great and awe-inspiring God. Some translations have it, the great and terrible God. Both of those are great translations in handling that word. Both of these point us to the concept that God is God Almighty. It points us to the concept that he is the supreme power and ruler of the universe and everything in it. We come to him and we call to him because he is God. He is the God that has created all things in absolute all when we consider what he has done. In other words, he is a God worth praying to because he is so unimaginably powerful and awesome. He speaks and worlds are created. Just take that into your heart for a minute. You know, when you're praying about your hangnail, getting taken off tomorrow, and it seems like the end of the world, just remember that this God you're praying to, yeah, he, he just, he spoke, and the earth was created. That is power, my friends. That is amazing power. He spoke, and stars filled the night sky. He spoke, and light became. This is the God. He is a God that thinks and hearts become changed. He desires and the sun stands still. He sympathizes and the blind receive their sight. Demons are cast out. His feet walks on water. Storms obey his name and people raise from the grave. Furthermore, he is the God that keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keeps his commandments. He is faithful to his word. And for that, he is to be praised. Just consume yourself with him in his glory for all that he is to be praised for. And let the first words out of your mouth when you 
pray to him, acknowledge his greatness. And with it, we see that when we pray, we humble ourselves. Look at what Nehemiah says. He says to the Lord, I confess the sins we have committed against you, all of Israel. Then he says, we have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept the commands and statutes and ordinances that you gave your servant Moses. He's saying, we've broken your law. He's saying, all Israel has done that. I've done that. My father has done that. We have all sinned against you. See, friends, Nehemiah sees exactly why the walls have been torn down and the people left in shame and disgrace. The reason is sin. And I know we, you know, we live in a time where we have trouble with this and nobody likes to be called out for the sins. I get that. I'm not real fond of it myself. But the fact of the matter is you can't rebuild and you can't be right with God unless you acknowledge that there is a sin problem to be dealt with. Israel had sinned against God, that they had abandoned the covenant of Moses, and the result is that God left them to their own devices and to harvest the rotten fruit of their putrid sin. And Nehemiah humbles himself and lumps himself right in there with them. This must be a hallmark of our prayer as well, that we get before God and we pray, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And with humility, when we pray, we must also honor his word. Look at this in verse 7. Folks, this is the big one. So very important. Verse 7. We have not kept the command statutes and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands... Even though your exiles were banished to the ends of the earth, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I choose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great and strong hand. Prayer that is not based on God's word is not prayer that will be received at the throne of grace. I don't care how sincere you are about it. I don't care how much you desire it. I don't care how much honestly you felt in your heart or anything like that. If your prayer does not accord to the word of God, do not expect God to hear that prayer. I mean, he is not going to act contrary to his nature, his will that comes to us through his word. Nehemiah knew that. That's why Nehemiah gives this incredible block of scripture in his prayer to God. That's why it's so important. One of many reasons that we are so, to be rightly informed by the word of God. That, that is why, friend, when I come to this pulpit, the first thing you need to hear is, let's take our Bibles. When you go in Sunday school, very quickly in your lesson, you should hear the Word of God. You come on Wednesday night, you need to be hearing the Word of God immediately when we gather together. Everything we do comes from and revolves around the Word of God. For all of this is vain, and all of this is useless. It's obvious that Nehemiah knew the word. And he pleaded and he prayed with God according to it. He called upon God to remember the promises he had made to Moses and remember the people that he had redeemed by his powerful hand. It's like the time that a, a woman received a wonderful answer to prayer and a friend asked her, he said, how do you explain it? How do you explain this incredible answer to your prayer and the woman said I don't explain it she said it doesn't need explaining she said it's like this I took God at his word and he took me at mine that's it God is pleased to answer prayer that is prayed in accord with his word and now we can see that when we pray we intercede for those in need look at what Nehemiah says in verse 11 please Lord let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. 
Give your servant success today and have compassion on him in the presence of this man. Nehemiah is here praying for himself. He is praying for his people and he's praying for King Artaxerxes. In the ancient world, there was likely no one more powerful than that king. A man of great influence, a man who decided life and death in his kingdom. But to Nehemiah, Artaxerxes is just a man like any other man before God. That's it. And Nehemiah knows that God can change and open and mold his heart. As child, Charles Finchon says, the Lord of history makes the decisions, not at Xerxes. And let us remember tonight, and may it transform our lives, that when we pray for ourselves, when we pray for others, that God can change any heart. I have seen it time and time and time again in my own life and in the life of those that I have prayed for. I mean, when we call upon Jesus, we are calling upon the one who by his death, his burial, and his resurrection for us has been exalted to the right hand of the Father. The whole governance of the kingdom of God is in his hand. Amen. And when we ask him to change our hearts, to change the hearts of those in our lives, we do so knowing that if he can make all things and he can overcome sin, Satan, death, and hell, then there is nothing impossible for him when it comes to prayer. And praise God for that. And praise God that he hears the prayers of the devastated, the destitute, and the downhearted. Trust in it always. There was a, a man in Cleveland, when we went up there on our mission trip, he, uh, he welcomed me into the church that me and Brother Bill stayed in. And I, I love this saying that he had. I mean, he, you know, he's a, he's a straight up northerner. You know, he, you, you, you got to really hone in to hear what he's saying and, and keep up with the, the, uh, the racetrack of words that is going on. But he would say something to me and it, it would be like, uh, you know, you, uh, y'all are going to stay in here and the bathrooms are there and there's hot water in there. Believe that. That's what he would say. Believe that. And he would say that about everything. Believe that. Believe that. And of course, I can't say it like he did, but he was always telling me, believe that. And what we're seeing here in Nehemiah is when that it comes to prayer, God hears our prayers with hearts that honor him and pray according to his word, and you can most certainly believe that. And I pray that you do tonight. Let's take this message and let's transform our lives by it, and let's become a people of prayer that rattle the doors of God's throne repeatedly as we seek him and his will to be done. Father, we come to you.